you that um, it was only at the very end. Actually, I think I saw this in Twitter, believe it or not, that people were saying, you know, we're, we're at the end of the semester, kind of all bets are off. If students need extensions, they get extensions. But what about the students who at the beginning of the semester titrated their time and did X and Y and Z? So I'm wondering about whether we need to announce those um, criteria or announce those uh, strategies at the beginning in order to also make it um, equitable. Does that, I, I don't think I said that correctly. I don't think I said it clearly. So if you understood it, <laughs> um, let me know. Go ahead, Haley. Yeah, thanks. Um, it made perfect sense to me, your question. Um, so just for the one example I've been talking about in the chat, this instructor made a whole video, um, actually a studio produced video that she scripted, just explaining her approach to, I think the title was like flexibility in this course. So it captured that policy, like she actually spoke to what was written in the syllabus and a few other ways in which um, she's tried to make the course successful. That is great. And I, I think that, um, you know, I think about that a lot. And in fact, one of, that's one of the things when students, it's one of my um, boilerplates when students say at the very end, can I do X and Y and Z? And I always say, um, well, I didn't announce that. It's not part of my contract with you or with the students. Um, and if we made that change now, there are other students who might have made different choices early in the semester. So I love, Haley, that that, is, that announcement is made at the beginning so that everyone goes into it with that um with that under with that shared understanding uh, it, it, i will tell you on twitter when people announce i'm sorry i sound like a teen well maybe teens aren't on twitter anymore they're on whatever but <laughs> whatever i don't sound like a boomer i guess which i am but um when people on twitter say oh you know it's the end of the semester and so i'm just telling everyone all the deadlines are are gone don't worry about it and those usually get like a gazillion likes and people just applaud it. And it actually makes me feel a little uncomfortable because I'm probably, I'm likely to have been one of those students who paced myself in the course and didn't do other things, didn't work on other courses in order to stay on task in that course. And then for the rules to be changed in the, um, you know, um, ninth inning um, makes me feel uncomfortable as a student. that it, it's, it's it, as if we can bake it in like from the very beginning and and we will still need to and I remember hearing this point over and over again in um, the labs that we've had on 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 accessibility and universal design universal design can help us reduce the number of accommodations that we would need to do but it will not eliminate all of them we will still need to make some accommodations so that that what can we do ahead of time that is sort of across the board for all of the course is one thing, but then we will also still need to be able to build in some things after that in order to address the, uh, the, the people who need it. Can I make one more observation? I see on the attendance that um, that one is a consistent winner, that people feel like um, the last one, Instructor Q. Um, that that's a strategy that seems to hit our two sweet spots um, better than any of the other strategies. And I'm wondering if that's a strategy that um, we might want to promote to um, other instructors. And what I see about that is that totally empowers the student to make their own choices. And I think that there's there's something about. In K-12 education, it's very structured. Um, instructors and their parents or families um, often will step in and provide a very tight structure for students to follow and students really don't have a lot of choice or a lot of empowerment right in, in that in college and some will use this as an argument for why do we do any of this coddling um, and helping our students along they're adults they can figure it out on their own in some ways this one does that the most it it lets the students have the power to say I can figure out how to do this on my own. I can find it in other places. I don't have to. And so the instructors are uh, when we do require attendance, they're saying no, you have to listen or you have to watch this video. Um, we talk about this in in analytics, learning analytics as well. Instructors will say you have to watch, you know, all two hundred, you know, 20 minutes of the video in order to get full credit versus. 
you know, here's a video. You might want to watch it, but you don't have to because I'm not going to charge you on, or, or grade you on whether you watch the video. I'm going to grade you on what you can do after watching or after, on what you can do, regardless of whether you watch or not watch the video. It's your choice. Thoughts on it being empowered there? And I see somebody has their hand up. Bill, go ahead. Or it can be something else. Yeah, well, I, my question's kind of related to this, is like, how do you sell that idea to instructors? I mean, looking at what we've done for uh, remote teaching, there's still a high number of instructors on campus that want people to attend synchronously to the point that they make students turn on their webcams. I can tell you, oh, sorry. I can tell you, Bill, the way I, as an instructor, try to sell it. And I actually just wrote um, a chapter about that talks a little bit about this, which is that I think it's a false sense of accountability that just being there and turning on your webcam is a false sense. And I love what someone said about it. I think it was Amy who said it's clear that how we see ourselves as learners is a big influence as to how we view equality and flexibility. And I'm so I'm going to see myself as someone who would be attending a webinar for one of my professional organizations that, yes, I could just sign up. I could just show up and turn on my camera. But my I my head might be some several different places. And that's a false sense of accountability that to me, a better sense of accountability is are they doing the work and are they mastering the learning objectives? And I think um, we're, we're going with low hanging fruit that if we think just showing up and turning on your webcam is getting the thing that we really want, which is doing the work and mastering the learning objectives. That's the way I would sell it. And Amy, to to your point, Liz, to build on that, how we saw our our own learning situations sets sort of the standard of what we perpetuate. Um, so if we had a very difficult time in grad school or in courses or whatever, and we had had to go through the hazing or you know that ritualized hazing in order to show that we can, you know, that we're strong enough, smart enough, whatever to 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 get through it. We feel like we often feel like, oh, we need to perpetuate that because college should not be easy, right? We shouldn't carry people through it. They need to sort of forge their way through it on their own. Um, and I think that that's a dangerous uh, way to sort of perpetuate the status quo um, and you know the systems and silos that we have right now instead of uh, a more diverse, uh, more opening, open and welcoming um, way of letting more people into our, our disciplines. Lisa, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, speaking to Bill's question, I think part of it is you can flip it around to the instructor and ask, why do you feel like attendance is so important in your classroom? What are you doing that's engaging your students that you want them there? Because if it's just a lecture, you can capture that lecture and people can watch that whenever. So I don't know if it's, it's some of it might be just like an ego, like I made this lecture, this is my classroom, you need to be butts in seats versus if you think that they're losing something, you know, like have them think about it. Like what are you providing the students that they have that they can't get unless they're attending your class? Lisa, I love that. I absolutely love that, which is what's the value added? I mean, I think about that with regard to synchronous synchronous sessions versus asynchronous, which is where's the value added? You need to show me that there is some true value added. And I will say about the ego thing, and I'm not going to make cast dispersions, um, but when we did a campus-wide survey on fairness of uh, disability accommodations, the one there were a couple that were really shocking to me that came from instructors, but one of them was that they don't see um, flexibility with attendance as being... <laughs> as fair as one might think. And I think it comes back to exactly what you were saying, Lisa, which is I prepared this. It's it's like your, your grandmother who's prepared the Thanksgiving dinner and you're not at the table, you know? It's like, I've worked really hard to prepare this lecture and I want you to be there. I, I think that the pandemic and the shift to remote will, I hope, cause us to think in much more flexible ways. And I see a lot of those comments coming up in the chat. And I'm just going to give a, um, uh, um, a uh, pitch right now for our members, the Teaching Academies Members Only Roundtable, which will be May 14th. Um, and um, a couple of the people who will be involved in, in that Members Only Roundtable will be there. And we're going to be talking about... Um, 
we're going to be talking about lessons learned um, from the pandemic and you know how can we shift ourselves to be as flexible and equitable as we hoped that we were during the pandemic. So enough about my pitch. Um, yes. And if you're not in part of the teaching academy, you should be because you have shown that you are interested in um, teaching and learning development. So just by being here, um, it, it shows that you're interested and you should join us and extend the conversation on teaching and learning with others in the campus. Um, should we get on to some of the questions that are uh, that are in here? Oh, I'm sorry. Be before we do, John, real quickly, I was going to just also flag a couple more that showed um, some yeah. high um the um last um instructor z uh, with regard to exams um that doesn't rely on high stakes exams or other quote must be present healthy and on top of their game on one specific in specific day of the entire semester to get credit for a chunk of the semester's achievements that one seemed to really also hit the sweet spot of both of those and just to circle back about our own experience um i grew up with a mother with a very um um, in, in, inconsistent. She had lupus and, um, you know, she, I, I've told the story, several of you have heard it, so I apologize. I know John's heard it, but um, for example, she could never make the commitment that she would be at my ballet recital because her health, she could not control her health, uh, but she could do so many other things to get us to that place in advance when she was feeling healthy. And I think about that a lot. And any of us who have raised children, I have the deluxe version with a, um, a, an offspring with significant disabilities. Anyone who's ever, John with his puppies. <laughs> yeah, you know? I mean, any of us who have ever had other life draws, we know that um, we can't always be at the top of our game, but in chair on that particular day. And um, that's the one that resonates a lot to me in terms of my personal experience. Um, and I am trying to think of the instructor's name and Martin, it might be you that has I think it is you that has lots of assignments. So you have a lot of accountability, but you don't say necessarily you have to do it at this time. You say it has to all be done by this time or this chunk of them have to be done by this time. But that lets the students work ahead if they know that they're they might have some um, surprises or something might flare up unexpected. They can work ahead to sort of put some in the bank for those days that um, that way they, they're not they don't miss a day and they're sunk for the semester or they they're you know they're out of college because they're because they're out for a week or a month or whatever um let them work ahead if possible to build up some of this sort of reserves so that when the tragedy hits or it doesn't sink them all right good any other thoughts before we start moving to the uh questions that we want to uh, talk about today folks a minute to raise their hand or to unmute and jump in. All right, see nothing. Well, let's move on then. Um, thoughts on how do we achieve equity and flexibility in office hours? And I think this is a great one. We know that um, the students who go to office hours often feel more connected to our instructors and that feeling of being more connected um, does a lot not just for the academic, but for their resilience and their uh, their connection, their their, their ability to, to sort of move on um, because often office hours are often not just about course content. They are often about relationship building and. Um, there's a lot of therapy, I think, in office hours, uh, whether we intend it or not, just through that human connection. So what do we think about that? Uh, should they be required? Should they be extra credit? Um, should they only be, you know, once a week between X time and X time? Um, do we have uh, online office hours uh, where students can just click a button and get into the office, uh, the virtual office, rather than trudge across campus to your building at your, you know, one hour a week? Thoughts on that? Heidi, I see you on mute. Go ahead. Um, sure. I have found that students tend not to 
attend office hours, but they do, if you repackage your office hour as a check-in with the Google Docs sign up and you offer these, you know, every week or every other week, uh, and you can tag them into an uh, assignment in Canvas so that it comes up in their in their feed. Uh, and I don't, they don't receive any additional credit, um, but uh, they're totally optional. But most, more students will tend to jump into that um, than, especially if if the check in has some kind of title or description like. We, uh, we're working on your your first draft this week. Uh, who would like to, you know, just check in on topic narrowing or something like that? Um, so keep it specific. Call it a 15 minute check in uh, and week by week you, you may see like handfuls of students um, take advantage of that. And I've seen them rephrased as student hours. I've seen them held instead of in the instructor's office, which has a huge power dynamic, you know, facing that certificate and that stack of books and all of the the sort of power um, indicators uh, there. If you have it in the classroom, that's a place that the students are already comfortable with. If you have it virtually, they're in their house where, you know, surrounded by their stuff where they can feel a little bit safer. Um, there's there's a lot of other cool little tricks that um, and, and your idea of like, let's focus on a particular thing. So it's not about come talk to me and we can have this awkward conversation about, I don't know, something that we'll eventually get to. But no, we have a structure. We have a thing that we um, can work on together and that. Eases uh, the conversations, um, then it's easier for the conversations to move into a, uh, a more social, more supportive, more um, I believe in you student, you can do this. Um, type conversation, which are wonderful conversations for office hours. And one other I, thing you, you can yeah. opt or offer, John, is some students, if they're uncomfortable uh, uh, being in a video conversation with you, I've also just made the chat as an option. So if you yeah. want to have your check in using the chat function in Canvas instead of uh, through Zoom or BBCU, um, that, that's another option. And a small yeah. number of students prefer that, and and they'll take advantage of that. I yeah, absolutely. The the even even an asynchronous sort of ongoing thing. So it's not just you know from ten to ten fifteen or whatever that period is, but today I'll be available on whatever to answer questions. Piazza is mentioned um, in the in the document here, um, and and I I just want to highlight that sort of the use of a forum. Let's lurkers into that conversation, right? So I might as a student have the question, but not be willing or confident enough to ask you about it. But if somebody else does, I definitely am interested and I want to, you know, look at that and see what's happening because I'm interested as well. I just am afraid to, uh, to ask it. And Piazza lets you ask those things anonymously, not anonymously to the instructor, um, but anonymously to the students. They won't look, you know, silly. Uh, or, or like uh, I don't get it and I should know it. So that's good. Um, yes, asynchronously, great. And the- I, I was gonna say, I will just mention also that we know that there are data showing that the more privileged the student, the more likely they are to attend office hours. In fact, most of us who have ever held in-person office hours or even virtual synchronous office hours know that it's a bimodal distribution. It's the, the students who probably don't even need to be there and then the students who should have been there like months ago. Um, right. But uh, <laughs> so they're not, I, you know, I, I, I love the, these suggestions for alternatives to traditional office hours. And I want to highlight what Bill put in chat here as well. This idea that um, if you empower the students to to help each other um, through these sort of support spaces where the students can help build, you know, one, they can answer questions for each other. They can share their strategies that you might not ever think about, but it work way better than your strategies. Um, and in doing so, they will build that sort of cultural capital that you know, often students really strive for uh, by saying, oh yeah, go to John, he's the resource for X, Y, and Z. Go to someone, you know, Bill knows all about this. Um, that's that's a powerful uh, motivator for that kind of uh, support and sharing. 
and that can be something outside of office hours that where the students support each other. Great. Next one. How do we achieve uh, equity and flexibility for in-class presentations? Well, I don't know a good answer to that one. Um, I do know that um, this idea of everyone recording in advance um, gives some flexibility there. Um, it lets people who are not it lets people showcase their skills and showcase their content more than and that might um, shine brighter than their ability to speak in public, you know, on a on a dot or um, under pressure. So there's a little bit of uh, equity in letting empowering the students again to practice and to think about what they're doing um, so that they're not on the spot. I, I see someone typing about the choices of the options, either pre-record or do live or whatever. And I can tell you a couple of my colleagues who offer those those choices um, have found them have found it to be pretty successful. And um, they have also found that um, students for whom English is not their, their, their primary language tend to choose the pre-record option. And um, which again is an effort toward um, equity. And actually, it's a lot like the the, the boxes thing, the the, the boxes uh, graphic that people were talking about earlier. The boxes and the fence. Great, and uh, Angela, go ahead. Yeah, um, I really like the idea of flexibility with presentations and. Um, both of the courses I've been teaching this semester have involved uh, pre-recorded presentations because you know we can't do it in person and they used to be all in person. So one course is a seminar where students have to do a 30 to 35 minute video where they're presenting a research article. And then the other course it's similar, but it's a 12 minute, so much shorter video. One thing I've noticed this semester, especially in the longer videos is a lot of what is very close to plagiarism with some of the presentations where presenting in a video I would argue is very different than presenting in person usually with a video you have a script or at least that's a better way to do it if you're trying to to stay on point um, but there's been several cases in fact one really blatant case uh, where I had to actually talk to the student but they are like lifting passages from the paper and then using that because they're you know, I don't know, they're worried about using the right terminology. And even though like with every single student, I've had a conversation about how it's much better to just use basic English and avoid the big scientific terms because that's you. It's become uh, it's become a really a real problem this semester. So, yeah, I guess that's one I kind of going back to equity. While presenting in person, you could argue is more difficult, and especially if you've got, you know, presentation anxiety, which many of us even that lecture all the time have anxiety about it. Um, there's like some real pitfalls depending on which one you choose. And I wonder if anyone's had any strategies to help students, you know, with the video format. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's in some ways it's equitable because of the anxiety issue and giving student options. But in other ways, the two different formats are are very different. Um, in terms of like what you're bringing to the table, if I'm, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but sure, Angela, this um, that's a, a compelling, um, a, a compelling example, and I don't know if this will help or not. But one of the things that I do is I require students to also turn in their transcript. Um, I do that actually for accessibility issues. And this sem this summer when I'm teaching, I'm going to also make my students caption their videos uh, because it's if you have a transcript, it's the next step. Um, but I'm wondering if, um, if it's the accountability of those words, because you said that you didn't see it so much when they were doing it in person, but they are now when they're pre-recorded, and that maybe they're not doing it in person because um, there's more accountability, that maybe turning in the transcript might be another level of accountability. But, you know, I also think, Angela, that... Um, I just feel like kind of all bets are off this year in the sense of like, can we really say that, the, you know, this works better or worse than this? I just feel like everyone is so fried that we might be seeing more bad behavior on students' pat part as well as instructors' part this year. And uh, yeah, I, I'm not, yeah, I don't know. You get it. I think that's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a struggle. Um, 
but yeah, I it's just I it's interesting to think about equity and and when you do offer multiple, I think on some of the on the little thought questions, I put like a five for equity, even if it was given giving multiple uh, means or modes of you know demonstrating knowledge, because depending on how you set that up, so some means or modes might be different in terms of what skills they require. And so that, you know, I don't know, it gets very complicated, but yeah, definitely totally. the video versus in person totally. I'm thinking about for the fall as we go back, but how to structure that. So the instructions are clear for both yeah. groups. Well, and there are some, you know, I said, I do video ones and there are some students who think oh, I'd much rather just get up and do it. I don't want to have to record. I don't want to have to, um, I don't want to hear my voice. I mean, I'm that way. <laughs> Who wants to hear their voice? You know, like if you're giving a presentation, you rarely hear your voice. Who wants to hear your voice? So I think that there's probably ways on both sides. But um, I do think for the accountability, I don't know if, if, if the, the I don't know if the um, putting the transcript would help, but um, at least it would say, you know, you've, you've documented that these are your own words in this transcript, even though they did document it in their video, too. So who knows? Um, Amy, I see your hand is up. Oh, go ahead. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, oh, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I just, you know, I had a couple of thoughts. Um, well, of course, with Angela talking about the Journal Club, but in general, just when you're talking about assignments and equity and flexibility, modes of learning, I think, are something that need to be considered. Um, and, you know, I teach lab based courses for graduate students. I also teach um, non lab based courses and I also teach courses for younger students. But, um, you know, each group brings its own challenge related to what's happening overall in their lives. And so, um, you know, I presume that you're going to test in the mode that you want to know what the skills are being developed in. So if it's a lab based course, a presentation isn't really a great <laughs> choice, right? You want to have them demonstrate something, but maybe given our remoteness, I've packed up lab kits and had students complete labs on their own and then they're doing a lab write up or they're attending a lecture and then doing a lab and maybe they could instead of doing a lab write up they could do a little video of you know sort of their skills and their results and their analyses and so I mean I think you know the flexibility to choose what works best for you provided it's testing in the mode that you want the skills demonstrated and seems reasonable. And as far as, um, you know, sort of the journal club and challenges related to plagiarism and using words that you know that students don't know what they mean, <laughs> um, you know, it's also possible to do something, um, you know, in the past I've, I've done is just sort of have a one to two page synopsis, right? So students summarize what the article is about and then also applications. So not only like here's the technology, here's what the researchers did and here's what they found, but here are some ways that we talked about the semester related to other techniques and technologies that this could be applied. So it's sort of this transfer of knowledge into a, another area that proves that they know what they're talking about, right? So it's sort of like, you know, if you can figure out how else a technology or a technique can be used, then you have moved into a new level of understanding that is demonstrated without having to get too deep into details and recording over or, you know, saying words that maybe you know or don't know, or maybe you know part way and you're just starting to synthesize information. And so, I mean, that level of understanding, I would not expect undergraduates to achieve. Some of them will, but most of them will not. And so, um, you know, those are just some ideas and things that came to mind. And I'll leave the floor now because I feel like I'm just, <laughs> just talking and talking. Well, it, it amplifies what we've seen in chat before is what are your learning objectives and then what are the different ways that, that they can be achieved? And you as an instructor, we as instructors, don't have to come up with the plan, you know, step-by-step -step recipe on the best way to do that. 
we can just say, hey, student, demonstrate that you have some level of mastery in these things. You know, put that those learning objectives in the rubric and then let them let them do that on their own. Come up with that on their own. Bill, I see you've got your hand up. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, you kind of went the same direction I was going because uh, sometimes I don't know. I feel looking at the over, you know, instructors evaluations and, you know, even mine too. Uh, earlier in my career, it was more about the format of something. It's like, OK, did this person do correct APA citations, you know, and six sources and such and so instead of the actual yep. content, as you said, the learning objectives. And as far as the videos go, one of the things that I've found beneficial is to give students like lower stake practice, you know, type assessments, you know, in the same format as their finals going to be. Yeah, as practice. Excellent. I want to make sure that we get Daniel's question in here about um, the lack of flexibility and and of course uh, in inequity here. Um, and this example of the students with the jobs or children, I, in some ways I, I feel like we did talk about it a little bit. Um, you mentioned my dogs. Um, your, your, uh, Martin, your, your, your mother with uh, uh, lupus and um, like those sorts of situations. I just want to check in. Are there other thoughts that people have about sure. that to, to this point? Sure. And, and you know, I'll respond to that too, that um, when I initially said that they tend to be competing courses, they don't always have to be. You can have an inflexible course that is also inequitable. And um, right. <laughs> so, and you can have, a, you know, they, they're all different flavors. And, but, um, so I'm sorry if I misspoke in saying that they are always competing forces because they clearly aren't. You can definitely have an inflexible course that's also inequitable and it's inequitable because of the lack of flexibility. Angela, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really good point that when there's not flexibility, you're automatically, you know, you're automatically like excluding people. And I think I think it was maybe Amy or somebody I was going back and forth with in the chat a while ago. We we're talking about how having that flexibility, especially around assignments, is really modeling real life because it's very rare that you're going to have a job where you can't go to your boss and say, hey, I know I've got this deadline, but things are happening, I need it another couple of days. Like most of the time, that's gonna be okay. And there are times when that's not be, gonna, you know, if you're a surgeon and you're having a bad day, that's really not gonna fly, you know, that, but it has to be a backup surgeon. But like, we have to, you know, model reality and there's those uh, hidden learning objectives. I like to think of those as my hidden learning objectives of, yes, extensions are okay. No, you don't have to tell me why. If it's beyond a certain time frame, yeah, let's have a conversation. But Real making students realize that, you know, because there are, I think, I think Morton was alluding to this earlier. Uh, there are students I attended, you know, upper class or they've got privileges earlier in life where they learned that lesson already. They've learned that they can ask and the worst someone's going to say is no, but there are students who don't know that. Um, so I guess to that point, um, I was trying to get to a point in there, which is I try, especially early in the semester, to actually like put that out there in an announcement, like, hey, reminder, your first lab report's due today, but if anything is happening and you need that extra 24 hours, shoot me a quick email. Um, so that way, not only is it listed and it's places, but you're really like encouraging. Um, and like that video that someone was describing earlier sounded great to just really like put it out there that this is okay and then create it as a normal thing in your course. All right, I would like to point out that it is two o'clock and you're all free to go, free to end if you'd like. I'm going to continue to stay on for a, a few more minutes and um, continue talking to you all, whoever wants to stay on, um, but I want to be respectful of your time. So um, thank you, Martin, especially for um, helping me put this together um, uh, and for always being a, a resource um, for thank me. Thank you to everyone. I thought this was really, I, I learned so much and I heard from so many different perspectives that um, this made my day, absolutely made my day. So thank you. All right. And again, I invite you to um, turn on your mics and videos if you'd like to and just jump in, have a conversation with me. Um, a lot of the formality of the lab, what little there is. Um, 
is off the table now, so um, feel free to jump in and say hi. And thanks again for everybody for joining. And, and John, I'm going to go um, join my other task of mosquito repelling. Good luck. <laughs> um, I want to point out, Martin, on that topic, there's a, a thing that we have not hooked up yet, but we bought and we spent a lot of money on it. It's the Biogents um, yeah. system. It uses CO2 cartridges um. and electricity to do this. Um, I've got a, a friend who swears by it, okay. and he says it's it's amazing. We bought it last year, but we haven't hooked it up yet because we bought it late in the season. Is it a large space or large space or small space? For, it, I mean, like is, something you do on your deck or something that you do for your whole yard. It would be it's it's for like an acre. Oh my! Or half acre. Well, we have three acres, so but I would yeah. I would go there. I would absolutely go there. I mean, right? Yeah. It's uh, it's, uh, it's, it's it's Biogens is the is the. Right, I've um, written it down. Thank right. you. This is great. Excellent. Take care. Bye-bye.